Okay, so if you'll take your Bibles now and turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Today we are turning to the uh, almost the last section of this chapter, where the author of Hebrews quotes the New Covenant from the book of Jeremiah. There's a lot to say about this passage, and I, I really want to look at the whole quotation of the, uh, of the covenant all in one piece. But as I was working on this, I have eight full pages of notes on this. And I, oh my goodness, I am, there's so many things that the, the new covenant is so important to us that there's a lot to say. So we're probably uh, going to come back. We're going to look at the whole thing today. We're going to come back in the next week or maybe two weeks. I don't quite know. I haven't quite decided yet. And talk about some of the other aspects of the, new, uh, of the new covenant. It's place in what the scholars call salvation history and uh, what it means for us. It's really, it's really a fantastic passage. It's one that uh, it is meant, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, it is meant, you'll see when we read it, for Judah and for Israel. So the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But God brings the Gentiles in, which gives us relief. And so we have a part in it as well. And it is the source of our salvation, this new covenant that God declared he would establish. So, so much to talk about with this, but today we're going to concentrate on the content of the new covenant. And uh, we're going to be following the quotation in Hebrews. If you compare it with uh, the, the source in Jeremiah, you'll see... Uh, of course, there's, there's differences because of translation choices. In Jeremiah, it's tra being translated out of Hebrew. In, uh, in Hebrews, it's being translated out of Greek, which was translated out of Hebrew. So as you make those translation choices from language to language, sometimes the vocabulary changes a little bit. But for the most part, it's pretty close. There are differences. The commentaries don't make much out of any differences between the two uh, uh, locations, and so we won't either. Now, uh, the, there are some questions that may arise in your mind from the content, and I, I won't be able to answer every question today, uh, and hopefully as we go along we'll answer some of the questions. But anyway, today the emphasis, uh, in Hebrews the emphasis is a contrast. There is an old way of relating to God. And there is, there is now a new way of relating to God. The old way was passing away. We saw the old priesthood passing away. We see the old uh, uh, sacrificial system is passing away. And the old covenant is passing away. And so that's our subject today. We recall that the, Hebrew, right, the readers of the book of Hebrews, the original readers, are, we think, mostly Jewish Christians who are facing persecution. They are facing the temptation to go back to Judaism as a way of relieving the pressure on them. And so, and some of them may have already done this. And so the writer of Hebrews, the author, he's working very hard to show how useless it would be to go back. And so here in the very heart of his book, he points us to the new covenant. Now, as I mentioned, it comes from the Old Testament. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, and we saw last week in, uh, in uh, verse, uh, let's see, uh, verse 7, it said, For if that first covenant had been faultless, which implies the first covenant had a fault. There was something wrong with that covenant. Now, uh, uh, and so he spoke then, through Jeremiah, it says in our text, in verse 8, For if finding fault with them, he says. But you'll recall that uh, there's a little bit of an issue of how that should be translated, and a couple of English versions will translate it the way I think it should go. Hebrew, uh, the New English translation puts that first phrase, But showing its fault, God says to them. There was a fault with the people, of course. God, uh, the children of Adam, everyone is born a sinner. Paul makes it absolutely clear. You read Romans 3, there's no way of escape. 
Everyone is painted with the same brush. We all are tainted with the same sin. We all inherit the nature of Adam. So therefore, we have a need for salvation from our God. And so, but, and so there, is, there is a fault with the people, but the fault with the old covenant that he's focusing on is not the fault of the people, but the fault of the covenant itself. Not that God uttered something false, but he uttered something temporary that could not last. I also want to make clear we are not talking about, and when we're talking about the old covenant here, the one that the new covenant replaces, we are not talking about the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. God made a promise to Abraham. He made no conditions. He, he, it was based on Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God. It, it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. God made a cut commitment to Abraham based on Abraham's relationship with God. And he said, I will give you a land. I will give you descendants. And I will make you a blessing in the earth. The land, the seed, and the blessing. That's the content of the Abrahamic covenant. It has never been annulled. It never will be annulled. God will keep his word. We see that repeated again and again through the Old Testament. And it is not, the New Covenant is not replacing the Davidic covenant. God made a covenant with David the king. It was not conditional on David. It was not conditional. David was notorious for some of the ways he failed to follow God. And yet God made a promise to him that he would have a son to rule. And of course, we see that fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, the king of kings, and lord of lords. And so that is not abrogated. That covenant is not replaced. But what was replaced is the conditional Mosaic covenant, which basically states this. If you will obey my laws, you will be my people. That sums up the Mosaic Covenant. Do this and live. It's another way it's said in the Old Testament. So, if you will obey, you will be my people. We'll be talking about that. The issue of the two covenants, the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant, this is the issue. How can I be a part of the people of God? I already talked about the condition of mankind. We are Sinners, we're born sinners. All of sin and come short of the glory of God, Romans says. Uh, there, there is none righteous, no, not one. We can go on and on. Just go, as I said, go through Romans 3. Paul lays it out for us. All those quotations from the Old Testament that clearly demonstrate God's view of mankind without him. Man is a sinner and has a need. So how can I, as a sinner, be a part of the people of God? And God says there is a way. And that's what this covenant is all about. So we're going to read our passage from uh, Hebrews 8, verse 8. Well, 8b, actually. I'm going to just read the covenant part of the passage. And we're going to read right through to the end of verse 12. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand, to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and, did not care, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people." And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So that's our passage. That's the new covenant, as quoted in Hebrews. Here's our proposition for the message, hope of eternal life rests in the new covenant alone. Hope of eternal life rests in the new covenant alone. This is how you must come to God now that we are in the New Testament era. All right, so I have the whole passage on the side of the screen. I don't know if you can read that very well. For those in the back, anybody want to wave if they can read it? Rob, you can read it? I thought the print would be too small. 
So I have decided to assist. Now I have old eyes. I was quite amazed, actually. I don't know if Wolf is watching. He's in his tour of Europe. He he uh, watched, followed our service last uh, Sunday. I understand, but I just have to say that uh, one of the things that impresses me with Ivan's song lead is, is he can read the verses that <laughs> go with the songs. For some reason, Wolf just always uh, can't quite see those. And I, you know, if I were sitting in the back, I can't quite see this. I have to get really close even to see this text on the screen in front of me. So I'm glad that you in the back can see, but I decided to make it bigger. So there you go. There's the first verse that we're going to look at. And the first point is proclamation. The first part of the new covenant is proclamation. Uh, so God's reasons for replacing the old with the new. Now, often I'll put other text on the screen. But in this case, I decided we're going to have to turn there. So I'm going to turn to a couple of passages. The first set are in Jeremiah, if you want to turn there with me. Or you can just listen. It's up to you. Uh, some of you have those it all on your phone, that we assume you're looking there, to Jeremiah. Chapter 7 is the first one I want to call your attention to. And I want you to hear what God, these are God's reasons for replacing the old with the new. God says here in our text, Behold, days are coming when I will effect a new covenant. I will put it in place. All right, so why is God saying this? Jeremiah 7, and I'm, we're just going to start with verse 16. As for you, Jeremiah, he's saying, do not pray for this people and do not lift up cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me for I do not hear you. Here God is saying to Jeremiah, I will not listen to your prayer for this people. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and the cities of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Do they spite me, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves they spite to their own shame? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, on man and on beast and on the trees of the field, on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and will not be quenched. So you see God's very stern statement. He says to Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. Often we have... Uh, friends who are, are who are opposed to God, they are they are walking in the way of the world. They are doing things that don't honor God, and we look to them and we plead with them. We witness to them. We wish that they would turn to God. We pray for them, but God says, "Don't pray for these people." The ones in Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm not talking about the ones you're praying for. God hasn't told you that, so this verse isn't for you necessarily, but it could be. There comes a point when God decides that that's enough for people. And he had decided it was enough for Judah. He was going to bring judgment on them. And Jeremiah was the last prophet in the land, the last major prophet in the land, uh, giving the message of judgment before the end uh, came under Nebuchadnezzar. And then verse 21 to 27, he continues, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And you will walk in all the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels in the stubbornness of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. And they did more evil than their fathers." You shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer you. So God is saying to Jeremiah, he says, all right, just tell, go ahead and offer your sacrifices. See what good it does you. Okay, go ahead. I will not hear you. The issue of the old covenant, he says, I didn't give it just so you would offer sacrifices. God doesn't need your sacrifices. God doesn't need anything from you. 
What he wants from you is a heart that loves him and will follow him. That's what he wants. That's what we wanted out of Israel. And so in Israel, they had all the forms. They had the, they had the temple. In Jeremiah's day, the priests were offering the offerings. They were doing the rituals. They would have the annual feasts. But they were also following the false gods of the heathens around them. And God says, your, your offerings are nothing. I do not hear you. That's what God is saying. And he says, I've sent prophet after prophet to you. F.F. F. Bruce, in his excellent commentary in Hebrews, says, Prophet after prophet came to Israel and Judah, recalling the people to their covenant loyalty. Jeremiah himself was no exception. Hear the words of this covenant and do them, was his call. In Jeremiah 11.6, we're going to turn there in just a moment. I should have stayed in Jeremiah. And with that call went the assurance that the blessings attached to the keeping of the covenant would still be theirs if they were, to the, they were obedient. Well, persistent disobedience to it would bring a curse upon them as it had done upon their fathers. And so Jeremiah 11 is the next passage I'd like to read in just a few verses there, verses 6 through 8. Jeremiah 11, verse 6 through 8. And the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of uh, Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers in the day that I brought them up from the land of Egypt, even to this day, warning persistently, saying, Listen to my voice. If they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart, therefore I brought on them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded to them to do, and they did not. And so, again, he's saying, I told them what to do in the covenant. He laid it all out. And we, we just finished reading uh, Deuteronomy on our Wednesday nights about, uh, oh, two or three months ago. Uh, and we saw that uh, the statement at the end as the, he renews the covenant with them. And he says, if you do not obey, here are the things that are going to happen to you. So again and again, God has laid it out. He sends the prophets again and again with this message. God will bring punishment if you do not keep the covenant. And so God says, I am going to bring a new covenant. Now, he's making a proclamation because of, their, uh, because of what they have done. He will bring a new covenant upon them. I just realized I have put the verses I want uh, in, this, in, the, uh, uh, in the text on the screen, and I forgot to do that part, so I'll just get there so I'm ready for the next thing I want to do. Well, let's look closely at Hebrews 8, verse 8 for a moment. He says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant. Now, I don't have in the big script there, but I do have down below. You'll look down and you'll see in verse 10. He says, I will put my law into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. And then down in verse 12, I will be merciful to their iniquities. I will remember their sins any mo no more. God is the one who acts to replace the old covenant with the new. One of the things that is necessary for salvation is that, there, that God do something. There is nothing man can do in order to enter into a relationship with God. We, we cannot earn God's favor. We can't compensate for our sins. We cannot do enough good works to fill up the great debt that we owe because of our own sins. We have the sin of Adam which attaches to us at birth. We have our own sins which start when? Well, in the crib, uh, two years old. Uh, you don't have to teach a kid to say no, as we say. They learn that one all by themselves. No, I won't do it. No! Don't tell, you can't tell me what to do. The, the, the rebellion is bred into the heart of man. It has to be trained out so that we can actually be somewhat functioning adults at some point in life, where we have our rebellion suppressed, at least to some degree. Uh, but, but that will not save us, being trained not to rebel. Being disciplined and following a rule, it will not save us. We need God to act, our, our passage says God is going to act. God is going to put in the new covenant. So this, uh, one of the commentators, this is F.F. F. Bruce again, the speaker in this oracle of the new covenant is God. It is to him that the repeated 
pronouns of the first person singular, I, me, my, refer. So our author, as is his custom, ignores the fact that it was delivered through Jeremiah. The divine authorship is all that he is concerned with. God speaks. God speaks, and he brings about this covenant. Now, the other thing that, that we note in our text here, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant. He is, the term new means the old is replaced. It's not merely a renewal of the old. It's not merely a revival. It's not merely another cycle, like the judges cycle. Go through the book of Judges, and you see that the people, as they forgot what did through Moses and Joshua, as they forgot that, they began to fall into idolatry and sin. God would send an oppressor, the Moabites, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the, uh, the I don't know, Edomites, various nations all around would become and they would uh, la lay taxes and burdens upon the people. They would uh, steal their produce. They would make life miserable. And then the people would cry out to God. And a judge, God would raise up a judge, and they would be delivered, and they would follow the Lord as long as the judge lived, the book of Hebrew, or Judges says. And then he died, and then are right back at it again. That is the way of Israel. Well, this new covenant doesn't mean just another one of those cycles. It's not just another period of revival where certain people in the nation have decided, well, we need to get back to the old ways. No, what it is is something new. This one is going to solve the sin problem forever. It's related to the old covenant. Yes, there is one sense it is related, but it is a replacement for the old in every other sense. And so that's the proclamation. That's what he declares to them. Now, before he gets... Uh, goes further, he gives us what is called, or what I'm calling, the negation. So verse 9, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. All right. Now I have a couple of other passages I want to turn to. Uh, or at least one. I'm going to put that on the screen so I remember to click the button. And we will look at that one in just a little bit. Uh, which one is that? Exodus 20. Yeah, we want to look at that one. All right, so now the day God took them by the hand, that is kind of a, 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 a tender expression. It, you think about Israel, it's as if Israel, the nation full of warriors and men and uh, 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 people of strength and power and reputation, that they're like little children. God took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's how he expresses it here in the covenant. So he's talking about the Exodus. And he's also talking on the, uh, that, uh, the, he's talking about the day on, at Mount Sinai when he made the covenant with them. So I want you to turn, first of all, to Exodus chapter 20. And verse 18 to 21, this is where the covenant begins to be made. Now, we, we, he has just, the Lord has just uttered the Ten Commandments. You know the scene, they call the people for a solemn assembly, there's the cloud on the mountain, the voice of God thunders out, uh, you shall have no other gods before me, and I will mess it up trying to remember them all in order, so I'm not going to, and I'm not planning to read that section. So this is what happens after God has done all of this. Verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So the people uh, ask Moses to speak to God for them. God speaks to Moses, chapter 21, 22, and 23. And that brings us next to Exodus 24. So let's go over there, Exodus 24. Moses has come from his meeting with God. He repeats to them Exodus 21, 22, and 23. And then uh, 
Let's see. God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, here's what they said, all the, Lord, uh, the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the revelation of Exodus 21, 22, and 23, that is the heart of the covenant, the old covenant. They People say, all that God has said, we will do. So then God says, all right, now, Moses, you come up to the mountain and speak to me, and, I, and you will reveal to me, uh, I will reveal to you what I have for these people. So I'm going to carry on with this passage, and this is where the covenant is established and affirmed and ratified. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning, and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the, covenant, the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of all the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. All right, so that is the beginning of the old covenant. That is where it was made. There was a sacrifice made. The covenants are made over the death of a victim. They represent the death of the people. The people are saying, God, our lives are forfeit if we don't obey. God is saying to the people, my life is forfeit if I don't keep covenant with you. There is a solemn covenant being made between the people. But God says, the new covenant is not like that one. It's not like the covenant I made with them. And notice how it says at the end of the verse, they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them. The words they and I are emphatic. The way, it's, the way the grammar works in Greek. They are put in first position. They did not continue, and I did not care. They were in breach, so I abandoned them. They refused, I judged, God says. The broken covenant cannot form any basis for the new covenant. The old covenant is negated. That's what God is saying. This is the negation. All right, so then that moves us on to the next section. And you'll see this is two verses, and this is called the affirmations. It starts with the word for. The literal Greek word is because. This is the new covenant that I will make. The new covenant is contrasted with the old. It is entirely different from the old. The new covenant involves God creating a spiritual change in the people. Uh, of the covenant. And this, in fact, is anticipated in the Old Testament. I have another passage I'd like you to look at. We're doing a lot of turning today, but I thought it was a good exercise. We've sort of gotten away from that with our technology. I can put everything on the screen, but I want you to turn and look, or look it up and l read it with me. 30, Ezekiel 36, 26 to 29. In the Old Testament, some of the things that the prophets said, besides Jeremiah uttering the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. We find here uh, Ezekiel 36. Am I on the right page? And I want, uh, let's see, verse 26. Moreover, Ezekiel says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefather, forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you. Here God declares to Israel about a time in the future when this there will be a change. There will be his laws in their minds. They will write them in their hearts, just as he says in the New Covenant. 
The new covenant reunites the nation. Remember, God said in verse 8, I am going to make a covenant. Days are coming. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house, the house of Judah, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Notice here, he says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, the united kingdom. All right? Not the one over there in you know, England, Wales, and all. The united kingdom of Israel reunites the nation. Right? The new covenant affects a spiritual change. New minds, new hearts. The old law, Westcott says, the old law was written on tables of stone. The new laws are written on the heart and become, so to speak, part of the personality of the believer. Now, we we're talking about Israel. I want to make it clear again. This new covenant in its primary application is with Israel, but we... We'll look at this either next week or the following week, how the Old Testament anticipates the Gentiles being brought into the New Covenant. All right? So the, new, the Gentiles are brought into the New Covenant. Here's something that happens when somebody becomes a believer. Their way they think starts changing. The things that they value start changing. The things that they love start changing. In their old life, before they be turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, they might have loved things that were not pleasing to God, that didn't honor God, that, that brought shame to their names. If, if it was something that they loved, but if people knew about it, they would have to hide. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. But then the, the whole life changes. The heart changes. The mind changes. And the things we used to love, we don't love anymore. And we lay them aside. And as we grow in Christ, there's new desires and new impulses. And somebody who is a Christian who says, oh yeah, I believed in the Lord, but they evidence no change of mind. No inkling of new things. The very least you need to do is say, have I really received the Lord Jesus Christ? The new covenant means God will put his laws into your mind. He will write them on your heart. You will be ashamed when you do those things that you know to be wrong. And you will ask for forgiveness. And you will turn. And it's not simply a matter of saying, okay, I'm going to try to do better. No, it's a matter of turning towards the right that becomes instinctive in the heart of someone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not trying to look for some kind of perfection. We're not trying to say that, oh, when you become a Christian, you'll never sin again. We're not saying that. But what we are saying is that there will be a change in the way you think. There will be an internal change. So the new covenant achieves what the old covenant could not. Exodus 6 and verse 7. And I have moved myself, so Exodus 6 and verse 7. <clears throat> I'm just going to be at this one quickly, so maybe you can slack off and not turn. But anyway, Exodus 6 and verse 7 says, Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the, under the burden of the Egyptians. All right, so God said to Israel, before he even did the covenant at, at Sinai, before they had all of that history. He said to them, you will be my people. I'll take you out. You will be my people. But it failed. The old covenant failed to produce that kind of relationship with the nation as a whole. Look at uh, the next one is Leviticus 26 and verse 12. Leviticus 26 and verse 12. Okay, it says there, I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, remember the negation here. They did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them. So the old covenant had the goal of making the people of Israel God's people. But it failed. It failed. Partly because it's the fault of the Old Covenant. That's what the book of Hebrews is saying. It is partly the fault of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is not adequate to accomplish this task. And so God says, I will give a new covenant. I will give 
the personal knowledge of God. Verse 11 of our text says, And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. Now, this promise of the new covenant is probably not complete, or at least fully complete, until the millennium. All right? We still have teachers. That's what I'm doing here this morning. But... If you are a believer, you have that new mind, you have that new heart, if you have the Spirit of God within you, and you are reading your Bible, the Spirit of God will instruct you. You know the Lord. I can be an assistance to you if I'm faithfully preaching the Word of God, but you as a believer already can have communion with God. Now, there's coming a day, and I won't have a job anymore. You won't need me. The Lord will be everything. Right? So that, that's what he's saying. That's part of the covenant that is coming. That is yet to come. The point is that people of God are no longer strangers to God. Everything has changed. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with God. A relationship that's eternal, that will never change. So those are the affirmations of the old covenant or the new covenant. And then one more thing. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. This is the foundation of the new covenant. This one again, the word for is actually the word because. This is the grounds of the spiritual change. God's mercy to the to the sins of the people, to their iniquities. Now remember what mercy is. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, eternal life. We don't deserve it. Forgiveness, forgiveness is, we don't deserve it. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. God not bringing punishment on us that we actually do deserve. Now a lot of people will balk at that. They're all fine with grace. I like presents. I like gifts. But don't tell me that I don't that I deserve something else. That I deserve God's punishment. That's the fact. That is the fact because of your sins. You do deserve God's punishment. But I will be merciful, he says, to their iniquities. The pledge of the is of the new covenant. It rests upon the for forgiveness on the part of God, not on performance on the part of man. That's Westcott again. It's God says he's going to take care of it. It's not, okay, if you will do these things, then okay, I'll forgive your sins. Or I'll be merciful to you. That's not how it works. God says, I will be merciful to those who are in the covenant. He, it's all for you. Now he says, and I will remember their sins no more. God, em and in fact, this is emphatic. In the Greek, it has the double negative. That means I really won't remember your sins anymore. The way literally it goes, and the sins of them I will not, not remember yet. That's the literal word order of the Greek sentence. So the double negative, very emphatic. In Hebrew thinking, remembering equals more than mental effort. It has consequences. So, <clears throat> for example, now, I've got, I'm not going to turn to these, but I'm just going to put these references up. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. That's the story, and, and then later in the passage, 30 to 33. God is speaking to Cornelius, the Roman centurion. I think he's a centurion. I forget what his office is. Anyway, he's saying to him, uh, he comes to him after Cornelius has been praying. Cornelius is a proselyte. He is a man who has been become interested in Judaism. He's turned away from the paganism of his past. And so he's praying to the God of heaven, and God sends a vision, something, says to him, I have heard your prayers, and I remember them. And I'm going to send a man to you. Then we have that story of Peter in the vision of the sheets, where the unclean food comes down, and he's three times, God says, eat it. And he's going, what? Lord, I've never done this. And, and then when the vision ends, he says, all right, there's some people coming to your door. I want you to go with them. They're Gentiles. Jews don't go into Gentile houses. 
Okay, that's, that's just the way it was. They didn't do it. And Peter said, okay, God said to go. I mean, he made it clear. So Peter goes. And then Cornelius tells him this same thing again. God said to me he would remember my prayers. You see, when God remembers something, he does something about it. It's not just, oh, yeah, yeah, that we had that deal back there. No, he does something about it. In Revelation 16, and then also in verse 18, I'm not going to turn to that one either, but this is the judgment of Babylon the Great. It says God remembered the sins of Babylon. And he's going to do something about it. Okay. In the Old Covenant, there's one more passage. We can turn to this one because uh, maybe we're still in Hebrews or at least you have a bookmark there. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. In the Old Covenant, every sacrifice was a remembrance. Verse 1, for the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, it would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have the, had the consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. In the old covenant, every sacrifice was a remembrance of sins. They had the daily sacrifice. They had the yearly sacrifice. They had their personal sacrifices they might make for various situations, but it was a reminder that I, there's a distance between me and God. Remember, remember, remember this distance. But God says, I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. In the new covenant, there is one sacrifice for sins. There's no remembering them. So there's four promises in this covenant. A new heart, a new relationship with God, a new knowledge of God, and permanent forgiveness of sins. Tom Constable says, these are the better promises that the writer referred to earlier in verse 6 of this chapter. Note that they are unconditional. The Israelites would not have to do anything to obtain these promises. And that brings me to our proposition once again. Hope of eternal life rests in the new covenant al alone. This new covenant is for you if you receive it. You don't have to do anything. It's all done. Jesus obeyed the law for you. He will give you a new mind and a new heart if you receive him. Years ago, I spoke to a young man who agreed with me about all the theology of salvation. He agreed that he was a sinner. He agreed that Jesus was God's son and paid for his sin. He agreed that salvation was by faith in Christ alone, but he said, I just don't think I can live it. Meaning that he didn't think he could live like a Christian. What he was missing was that God would give him all he needed for his living. Now that was a problem for him, but it's a worse problem for someone who says they have received, but show no change of heart or no change of mind. You know, he's on the other side. He has not believed. He has not received. And he's saying, I can't live it. And we're saying, look, you don't have to worry about living it. Just give your heart to Christ and he'll take care of the rest. All right. What he probably was really saying is, I don't want to believe. But here's the thing. Sometimes people will say, I, yeah, I believe. I want, to, I want to escape hellfire. That's a good thing. I want to have eternal life. That's a good thing. But then they say some words to God. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. However you say it, there's different ways to pray that. And nothing happens. Why? Why? Because are they depending on magic words they said to God that that will make all things good? <clears throat> Are they thinking that Christianity is just, you know, you put on, you do the initiation and you do the ritual and then you're good? If there has been no change, then there needs to be a look inside. Am I really a Christian? Now, you say, well, how much change do I need to look for? 
Do you love God? Do you really love God? Are you ashamed when you sin? I had a fellow who's in our church, and he had a lot of trouble. He had a lot of problems. But you know, he came to me, and he made a profession of faith in Christ, and there were little glimmers of a new heart and a new mind in that man. Now, he had a lot of problems, and he's passed away now, and I hope he was a believer. But at least there was something I could see. Now, sometimes there's people, you just can't see anything. Those are the ones I'm really concerned for. So here's the call of Christ. Trust Him to save you from your sins. He's made the promises. He's grafted us in. We Gentiles can have part of this just like the Jews. And we can have the new heart and the new mind. But we do have to turn to Jesus. That is necessary. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time today and thinking about the new covenant and what it means and what you say about it and how necessary it is. Lord, I pray that we would stir in our hearts faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's somebody here today who has not given their heart to the Lord, I pray that today would be the day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.